In 15.2, we're going to continue our journey into um, the different types of equilibria. And so in this case, we're going to talk about Lewis acids and bases and their formation of complex ions, which are an equilibrium condition with ions in solution. And so here's our learning outcomes expectations. Feel free to pause and review those. All right, so Lewis acids and bases. And so we talked about acid and base chemistry in chapter 15, but it turns, or chapter 14, it turns out there's a few different de definitions of acids and bases. And so for this section, we're gonna break it into our subcategories. We'll first define what Lewis acids and bases are. Then we'll talk about complex ions, something that can form from Lewis acid base interactions. And then we'll talk about the equilibrium constants that describe those complex ion formation or dissociation. And so um, there's a few different definitions of acid-base chemistry. And so the first one was by Arrhenius in 1883, basically proposed that acids and bases are something that generates H plus in water or generates OH minus in water. And so Arrhenius' definition was limited. It said acids and bases can only exist in water and it's based on whether they make H plus and OH minus. Um, in chapter 14, we learned about Bronsted-Lowry acid-base chemistry, and in this case we talked about acid as a substance that can donate H+, and a base as a substance that accepts H+. Uh, note this definition is independent of water, which means it's much broader. Acids can exist in any solvent. They can even exist in the uh, gas phase. This is by far the most common thing people use when they describe acid-base chemistry. In particular, uh, things like pH are related to the H+, concentration, which typically we're discussing Bronsted-Lowry definition. But there's another definition of acid-base chemistry, and this was by Lewis. It came out about the same time as Bronsted-Lowry, and this is the broadest definition of acid bases. And Lewis said, an acid is a substance that accepts a pair of electrons, and a base is a substance that donates a pair of electrons. And so you guys might remember the name Lewis from Lewis dot structures. It is the exact same Lewis. This is Gilbert Lewis. Uh, and he basically came up with Lewis dot, the octet rule, how to do this bookkeeping in terms of species. And so he spent a lot of time thinking about electrons. And he also proposed a definition of acid-based chemistry based on the electrons. And so, so in this case, we now call them Lewis acids or Lewis bases. And so here's just a quick description of uh, Lewis acids and bases. A Lewis base is any species that donates a pair of electrons, which basically needs, means you need a species that has a lone pair of electrons that can donate to something. And you have a Lewis acid, which is a species that can accept a pair of electrons. And so in organic, you'll learn about electron deficient and things like that. Things that are lacking electrons tend to want them and they're gonna do it by any means necessary. And one way to do that is through forming this Lewis acid base adduct, or, or, or it's basically a Lewis acid base bond formation. And so in one case, you have a Lewis acid, which is electron deficient. You have a Lewis base, which has a lone pair of electrons. These can actually interact and form this acid base adduct. And so here's the example with uh, BF3 and NH3. BF3 is electron deficient. This is the Lewis acid. Lewis base has a lone pair of electrons. You could actually generate this Lewis acid base adduct species. And so uh, it's, it's not quite a covalent bond necessarily. It can be very strong the interaction can be very influential, um, but it's not uh, how we typically count electrons. And so in this case, many of these are temporary. They come together, they fall apart. Some of them are really stable. It depends on the interacting species. And so one thing to note about this Lewis acid base definition, unlike the Bronsted-Lowry, it doesn't there's no protons involved in this process. At least the protons don't have to be accepted or donated. That's the Bronsted-Lowry definition. That's chapter 14 talking about those acid-base chemistries. Uh, in this case, we're talking about electron donation, electron accepting, Lewis base, Lewis acid. And so let's just do some examples of this. One of the really common ones you'll see in organic chemistry is uh, um, diethyl ether with its oxygen with lone pairs of electrons. Um, this guy, again, go back to our definition. Lewis base is electron donor. Lewis acid is electron acceptor. In this case, uh, this is the Lewis base. This is the Lewis acid. You can make this adduct of aluminum trichloride with the uh, diethyl ether. And so there's the base, there's the acid, there's the adduct. Uh, one we'll talk about in this chapter in particular is taking transition metal ions with um, you know charged species, typically charged species, but you can make a soluble complex ion, which is what that is. And so you have a base, which is an electron donor. You have an acid, which is an electron acceptor. You have your Lewis acid base adduct. 
Um, in organic chemistry, um, you'll learn about arrow pushing, which is essentially moving electrons around and doing reactions or describing reactions via arrow pushing. Uh, in this case, if you take carbon dioxide and combine it with a, sodium, or a hydroxide ion in solution, you make this carbonic acid species. And so the way this happens is this lone pair of electrons attacks the carbon, and then this electron goes here. This is, a, again, a Lewis base acting on a Lewis acid to donate electrons. And in this case, you actually make a covalent bonded species. Um, this is just a general form of making complex ions. In this case, you can have a transition metal ion. Things like water or anything that has a lone pair of electrons to donate can actually make these adducts, which we will describe as complex ions in a little bit. Interestingly, we can take H plus with OH minus, and we can do this arrow pushing, and we can say, okay, OH minus has a pair of electrons to donate. H plus is electron deficient. This is acting as a Lewis base. This is acting as a Lewis acid. We have a Lewis acid acid base adduct, which is H2O. And so the thing you'll note about this is this is Bronsted-Lowry chemistry, right? We have an H plus. This is the acid. This is the base uh, by Bronsted-Lowry definition. Well, it turns out it's all also the same by Lewis acid base definition. And so there's your three major definitions. Arrhenius said that acids and bases only exist in water. You can generate H plus and OH minus. Bronsted Lowry defined it based on H plus, whether it donates H plus or accepts H plus. And Lewis had a separate definition that said if it accepts a pair of electrons, it's an acid. If it donates a pair of electrons, it's a base. And so the way I like to think about these in terms of you know the broadness of the definition or which one encompasses the others is in terms of Venn diagrams. All right, and so Venn diagrams, you basically take circles of things that are different and you make an overlapping region where things are the same. And so a really fun example of this, a goose playing a keyboard, a beaver playing a, a guitar, and then you have a, a platypus playing a keytar, which combines all aspects of both of those. And so that's the Venn diagram overlap. And so if you do a Venn diagram of acid-base chemistry, you'll find that Lewis acids and bases is the broadest definition. All right, it says if it's electron pair acceptor and electron pair donor, Lewis acid covers everything. A more specific definition is Bronsted-Lowry, where we're only talking about H plus uh, donor and H plus acceptor. Note that if an acid is an H plus donor, it is also an electron um, pair acceptor. And so this is this definition, Lewis definition, encompasses Bronsted-Lowry, and Bronsted-Lowry encompasses Arrhenius, which is just basically Bronsted-Lowry specific to only aqueous conditions. And so you can look at this a few different ways. Um, Lewis, you have an electron donor to an electron acceptor. Bronsted-Lowry, you have an electron donor, and the acceptor in this case is defined as H+. And then Arrhenius, you'd specifically define it as OH- and H+. And so yeah, uh, slightly different definitions, convenient for different purposes. Mostly we don't use Arrhenius anymore. It's typically only Bronsted-Lowry if we're talking about H+, and pH, and things like that. But Lewis is convenient under some circumstances, particularly you'll hear about this a lot in organic synthetic chemistry, um, where Lewis acid-based chemistry is useful. You'll have a Lewis acid-catalyzed or Lewis-based catalyzed reaction. All right, so that defines Lewis acids and bases. And so let's do something useful with them. Let's make something called complex ions. And we showed these two examples earlier. You take some kind of transition metal, that middle portion of the periodic table, put it with some kind of species, which we'll call a ligand. Uh, this is the base, this is the acid, this is the base, this is the acid, and they make these, these complexes that look something like this. And so uh, what we're going to describe these all as is complex ions. And so we have ions like CN minus. We put some ions together with other ions or non-charged things with ions, and we can make these soluble ionic species. And so these are also known as coordination complexes. Typically, it's going to be a transition metal in the center and then something surrounding it. But the thing to note is that it's a soluble species. Same thing with this HgCN4, uh, right? This mercury cyanide, this is an aqueous species. It is soluble. And so and typically, you'll have a metal ion that acts as the Lewis acid. You have some kind of ligand, which is basically a species with a lone pair of electrons that can act as the Lewis base. And this ligand can be charged or uncharged, uh, depending on the nature of what that ligand is. And so you take this metal ion with a ligand and you make something called a complex ion. And so the thing to note about this that makes it different from, say, KSP is that this is a soluble species. It's not that this is coming together with this and it's making a solid. No, this guy is soluble and it's called a complex ion because it's an ion. It's charged. It has a plus or a minus charge associated with it. And so it's going to be typically soluble in solution and stable as this particular form.
And so we have this metal ion plus this ligand giving us this complex ion. Uh, the other way we could draw this is in the equation form, right? We have M plus and it could be any charge. We have ligands, um, in this case six of them, giving us this ML6. And so what's important about this is again, this is an equilibrium, right? These, these things are not typically not unidirectional. They're not completely stable. They can fall apart. They can form uh, back and forth. And so you can have this ML6 going back to the M plus and L um, neutral. And so we can draw an equilibrium constant expression, which again is products of the stoichiometry over reactants of the stoichiometry. Products is ML6 plus, that goes up here. Reactants are the M plus and the uh, six L's. And so M plus L to the sixth, that's our equilibrium constant expression for this. And so this we have a, just like we had with KSP and KA and KW, this is a special example of an equilibrium constant. So we add a little subscript that indicates what type of equilibrium constant. In this case, it is the uh, formation constant or the stability constant for the formation of a complex ion. And so KF means formation, taking dissociated things, making a complex ion, KF tells us how favorable it is to make that product. And so here's just a really cool visual example. Um, you take cobalt 2 plus, you add some HCl, you make a complex ion. It's cobalt Cl4, this cobalt chloride species. And you can see it's still soluble. This guy's pink, this guy's blue. It's not a precipitate, it's still forming a solution. And we're doing this through complex ion formation. We're taking cobalt 2 plus, we're adding some Cl minus ions in the form of HCl. This Cl minus interacts with cobalt 2 plus to generate this complex CoCl4 2 minus. And again, it's a soluble species, you can see it in solution. And so there's the equilibrium constant expression, products to the stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry. Again, all these are aqueous species, they show up in the equation. Uh, you have to take into account uh, stoichiometry, which is why there's a four there. And yeah, this describes how, how stable the uh, complex is or how likely it is to form a complex ion. And so same rules as we had in chapter 13, same rules we, we've seen over and over again, K, right? The larger the K, the more it favors products. Products in this phase is the complex ions. The smaller the K, the more it favors reactants. In this case, it is the dissociated uh, transition metal plus whatever the ligands are. <coughs> and so that KF value effectively tells you how stable is it forming this complex ion species. And so we can go to tabulated values and you can check these out in the back of the book. But basically you can take, you know, a bunch of transition metals, a bunch of ligands together, and you can measure how much complex ion you form and you can get this K formation constant. And so in this case, we have Lewis acids, which are the transition metals. We have Lewis bases, which is the ligand species. Most of them are charged. Some of them aren't, like NH3 has a lone pair and is not charged. But all of them make these complex ions. Each one of these is an ion. Each one of these is soluble in, in solution. All these are aqueous species, and we can measure an equilibrium constant for them. And so the larger this KF value, the more stable the complex. And so we saw this AGCN example, this mercury cyanide. 10 to the 41. That 41 means we favor this guy basically 41 orders of magnitude more than these guys over here. And so it heavily favors products. Other these uh, other numbers are smaller, 10 to the 6, this cadmium iodide favors products still, but favors it less than say these other ones do. And so, yeah, you can look at comparing any of these guys this one, this AGCN is more stable than AGNH3. Um, uh, CN, uh, uh, copper cyanide is more stable than say silver cyanide. Basically cyanide would rather interact with copper than it would with silver. This is a more stable complex. And so this table effectively tells you, you know, how strongly do these two things want to interact, competitive between them. Um, in this case, CN would rather interact with silver than NH3 would, right? And so this is a more stable complex ion. So you can compare affinities based on just this KF number. And so yeah, just to review, KF is this formation constant. You take a Lewis acid, an electron acceptor, you take a Lewis base, an electron donor, and you make this complex ion species, which is soluble in solution. You have products over reactants, which gives you a KF value. This KF value tells you how stable this complex ion is or how favorable it is for these two things to come together and give you a complex ion. Now remember, we can draw our equilibrium constant, our, our equilibrium equations either direction, right? And so in this case, we have the Lewis acid base on the left as reactants and the complex complex ion as the products, but because this is a double-sided arrow, we could just as equally draw it this way. 
And so if we put the complex ion on the left and the ions on the right, we know from our previous rules that we can, we can relate these two equations to each other by doing one divided by that equilibrium constant. And so if we, we flip this reaction around, one over Kf gives us the K for the reverse reaction. And the K for the reverse reaction in this case, we have a special definition for it. It's known as a KD value. And in this case, it's a dissociation constant. It basically says, how favorable is it for this complex ion to dissociate, dissociate into its constituent parts? And so we have a complex ion, breaks up into its Lewis acid and its Lewis base species. We can put a number on this. That number is KD product over reactants. Products in this case are the ions. Reactant is the complex ion. The number KD is related to KF simply by 1 over KF equals KD or 1 over KD equals KF. And so again, the same rules as chapter 13. Uh, in this case, it's, it's just saying, you know, if you draw the equation this way, you have a KF value. If you draw the equation this way, it's a KD value. KD is equal to 1 over KF. If KF is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 7, it tells us the dissociation constant is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 8. And so you might ask yourself, you know, why would we use, you know, KF over KD when they represent essentially the same thing? Well, it depends what you want to talk about. If you, you have something that you want to form a complex ion, it's more convenient to talk about this number. The bigger the number, the better. If you have something floating around in solution and you want to know if it's going to release one of those species, say this is like a drug delivery mechanism where NH3 is useful somewhere in the body, you might want to know the dissociation constant and find the higher value. It really depends on what you want to discuss. So yeah, there's your take home on KF and KD. Again, these subscripts just say a particular uh, special set of equilibrium uh, equations. Uh, KF is formation of a complex ion. KD is dissociation of a complex ion. But all the rules from chapter 13 hold true. Is K large? Is K small? If we fit, flip the equilibrium, we can multiply equilibria together. All those rules still hold true for complex ions. All right, one thing to note, and this trips people up a lot with this KD, is we have, you know, this complex ion going to Ag plus and NH3. Um, this kind of looks like the KSP equation. The big difference between this and the KSP equation is that this is a soluble species. If there was an S here, this would be effectively a KSP equation. This is not an S. This is not a solid species. This is a complex ion. And so note, don't mix up KD and KSP. They look similar. The difference is solid versus aqueous species. All right, so here's our summary. We have three different definitions of uh, acid-based chemistry. We have Arrhenius, which can only happen in water. We have Bronsted-Lowry, which is donating and accepting H+, which we covered in chapter 14. And then Lewis comes along and says we have a acid-based definition where an acid accepts electron pair, a base donates an electron pair, and we can make these Lewis acid-base adducts. And uh, one particular class of those is complex ions, also known as coordination complexes. Basically says we put these, this typically a transition metal with some kind of Lewis base or ligand. That ligand coordinates to the metal center. You make a complex ion that's soluble in solution, but it's not the same as the, the ligand in the metal alone. And so the equilibrium constant we use to describe this is Kf, or uh, formation constant, where you take the uh, Lewis acid and base, they form a complex ion in solution. A uh, complex ion is product, that's Kf. You can also talk about the complex ion falling apart into its constituent parts, and that's described as the dissociation constant, Kd. And this Kf and Kd are related just by reversing the equation, right? If, if Kf is the forward direction, uh, one over um, Kd is the reverse direction, you can relate these numbers numbers to each other, but they're describing essentially the same thing. It just depends on which way you draw that equation. All right, so that closes out our Lewis acids and bases. Uh, next, we'll get into coupled equilibria, start, starting to take some of these ideas and combining them together.